الله بالخير دراسة بعنوان ستار من الدخان كيف تستخدم الدول الحرب في أوكرانيا لدفع سباق تسلح جديد نشرها مركز الأبحاث الهولندي Transnational Institute تكشف أنه منذ انطلاق العملية العسكرية الروسية في أوكرانيا تعهدت الحكومات الغربية بتوظيف مليارات الدولارات من أموال دافعي الضرائب في سباق التسلح العالمي ولدعم المجمع الصناعي العسكري فمن يدفع باتجاه تضخم الميزانيات العسكرية لدول الناتو ونشر خطاب جنون الحرب كيف تستخدم الدول الغربية الحرب في أوكرانيا لتجديد مخزوناتها من الأسلحة وتوسيعها وتحديثها وكيف يستفيد المجمع الصناعي العسكري من حرب أوكرانيا لتوظيف المال العام؟ في دعم صناعة الأسلحة وإعادة تشكيل الأنظمة القائمة لتجارتها نرحب بكم ونرى ونسمع أكثر من ضيفنا ريتشارد بويد باريت النائب في البرلمان الإيرلندي في البعد الأقرب هذه الميادين وأنا زينب الصفار خليكم ويانا Richard Boyd Barrett is an Irish TD for People Before Profit Solidarity, helped organize mass protests against the invasion of Iraq in 2003, demanded the expulsion of the Israeli ambassador from Ireland, and imposing sanctions on the Israeli apartheid regime. Richard Boyd Barrett, salam and welcome to Al Mayadeen. This is the proximate aspect, and I'm Zainab Al Safar. So good to have you, sir. Uh, thanks for inviting me, Zainab. Always a pleasure. Well, um, the Irish Neutrality League, the INL, endorses a recently published report by the Transnational Institute titled Smoke Screen, How States Are Using the War in Ukraine to Drive a New Arms Race, which observes that Western governments have pledged unprecedented financial support to militarism, citing the threat posed by the war as a justification. Uh, Richard, who benefits from ratcheting up military budgets and deploying this war frenzy rhetoric, despite mounting evidence that this strategy does nothing to curb geopolitical tension? Well, I, I think there are very powerful and significant elements within the European Union, um, obviously in the, in the United States, uh, and sadly, even in our own country, which mm -hmm. <clears throat> is supposed to be and is held by the majority of people in this country to be a neutral country, but who wish to and have long wished to uh, ratchet up militarism and in particular to militarize the European Union, to develop a European army <clears throat> and to boost the uh, European military industrial complex, mm -hmm. complex to the benefit of big arms companies. And I think uh, those forces have seen the, uh, the invasion of Ukraine, which I have to be clear, I condemn the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. However, it is also clear to us that the European Union, uh, the big Western powers, NATO, have have grasped this as an opportunity to accelerate mm -hmm. uh, militarization and to move the European Union towards a greater level of militarization. Who are uh, these forces, Richard? 
Well, I think they're a combination of political forces mm -hmm. uh, and then the military industrial complex itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I mean, on the political front, uh, I think there, uh, there are uh, obviously countries uh, like France, elements in Germany, many of the big, the old imperial powers mm -hmm. uh, who have long harbored the desire to develop the European Union uh, both as a political and military force that can compete with the other big uh, power blocks in the world, whether it's the United States or Russia or China. But allow me to ask you here in coming back to Ireland, Michael Martin, the Irish Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Defence, declared that Ireland would not need to hold a referendum to join NATO as it is a policy decision of the government. Um, the Irish government has deliberately obfuscated or obscured the meaning of neutrality by counterposing political and military neutrality. This debate is set to heat up in uh, a radically new defense uh, landscape. Knowing that across three decades of polling, uh, four in five people in Ireland wish to retain neutrality. How do you sir define the irish neutrality and its foundations would ireland remain neutral vis-a-vis -vis joining the nato well this is a very important question because uh, irish neutrality is not clearly defined legally or constitutionally mm -hmm. but as you say the vast majority of people in ireland believe we should be neutral not just militarily neutral but politically neutral in the sense uh, of not involving ourselves with wars or big uh, imperial powers. And that, that tradition dates back to the Irish Revolution. Uh, the Irish Revolution uh, was a revolt against British imperialism, but it was very importantly uh, also a revolt against the imperialism of the First World War. Uh, the uh, the Irish Neutrality League was originally set up by the Irish revolutionaries, the people who led the Irish Revolution, in 1914 when the First World War broke out. Uh, and the people who were later to lead the Irish Revolt in 1916 and the Irish Revolution between 1918 and 1923 were very, very clear that they wanted to impose the, the imperialist logic that had led to the slaughter of the First World War and that a, a liberated Ireland must never align itself with big imperialist or warmongering blocs, but re must remain neutral uh, of them. Now, that is the tradition, that is the feeling of the vast majority of people in Ireland, but because it was never very clearly defined constitutionally or legally, mm -hmm. the government are now trying to exploit that uh, legal and constitutional ambiguity to move us away from neutrality and to move us closer closer to European militarization and to NATO. Is the West today, Richard, really investing in peace and peace efforts and dialogue and a ceasefire? Not at all. Mm -hmm. um, not, not at all. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, as I said, I share completely the condemnation, the justifiable condemnation of uh, what I think is an inexcusable decision by Vladimir Putin to invade Ukraine. However, I think rather than Europe and particularly neutral countries like Ireland using their position to argue for de-escalation and for a peaceful resolution to the conflict, instead they have seen it as a opportunity uh, to accelerate a project of militarizing the European Union, of increasing expenditure on militarism and on arms, uh, and indeed uh, requiring member states of the European Union to progressively increase their military expenditure. Sir, uh, while Ireland is facing a large housing crisis and the government's decision to lift the eviction ban, Plus also the increasing rates of inflation, the soaring gas prices, the ailing health sector, healthcare sector. Um, all these are mammoth, unprecedented challenges, not only in Ireland, but also across Europe. 
do capitalism and the big corporations control the life of the European citizens today? I, I think they are very, very dominant. And it, it is clear there has been enormous mm -hmm. profiteering by, for example, energy companies, both across Europe, across the world, I would say, but certainly across Europe and very much in Ireland, where while ordinary people have been crucified with uh, extortionate increases in the cost of energy, uh, we have seen record profits being made by the energy companies, by the electricity and gas companies, uh, and similarly in the area of housing. Right. Now, uh, the trend towards militarism did not begin as a consequence of the Ukraine war, ostensibly. Even before Russia's military operation in Ukraine uh, in 2022, the combined military expenditure of NATO members was more than 17 times that of Russia and roughly four times that of China. Uh, today, uh, Richard, how do Western states use the war in Ukraine as a pretext to renew, expand and modernize their stockpiles of armament? Well, I, I think you've said it there. I mean, the, the biggest uh, the biggest sort of imperialist military machine in the world is the United States, uh, far in excess of any other of the big global powers. Uh, NATO has been engaged for since the end of the Cold War in a very systematic expansion uh, into Eastern Europe uh, and connected to that a project of uh, trying to militarize the European Union. And indeed, um, there have been treaties long before the Ukraine war, which have required uh, sig members of the European Union who are signatories of those tr treaties to, quote, progressively upgrade their military capabilities and indeed have tied European member states into progressive increases in the proportion of their national resources mm -hmm. that are put into uh, armaments. So yes, absolutely, there has been a very long-standing and systematic campaign to increase military expenditure and to militarize the European Union and pull the European Union close, closer to an expanding NATO military alliance. Uh, but certainly, uh, that the Ukraine uh, conflict has then uh, provided them with further ammunition, if you like, pardon the pun, uh, to further accelerate that program. Yes, there's also another challenge here, uh, Mr. Boy Barrett, that the Transnational Institute report clearly indicates that arms, in particular small arms, that are now being shipped to Ukraine as part of Western countries, of course, support for the country's war effort, may eventually end up in other countries or sold to criminal networks operating in the shady arms underworld. Uh, to add pain to injury, media reports have highlighted that several banks and other investors would look favorably on changing policies to end the exclusion of arms companies from investment opportunities. So, uh, unbridled militarism here, right? Without a doubt. I mean, one, look, the, the European Union has an enormous corporate lobbying uh, situation. I mean, we often talk about in the United States how corporate lobbyists have... Uh, captured, if you like, much of U.S. politics and the White House. And there's no doubt there's a very similar situation going on in the European Union, uh, where there's a tremendously powerful, well-resourced uh, military industrial lobby that is pressing, constantly pressing the European Union uh, to increase arms expenditure and to generally facilitate uh, uh, the profiteering of the arms industry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's something that we continuously rail against. And obviously, we argue that Ireland should have absolutely nothing to do uh, with this dangerous project, which ultimately, you know, leads to war if, and conflict and needless death. I mean, you're producing weapons that are designed to kill people ever more sophisticated, whether they're small weapons or whether they're uh, very large uh, weapons and missiles. True, yeah. true. But is, uh, allow me here to ask you something, uh, Mr. Richard Boyd Barry, that is Ireland today investing or trying to mediate in any kind of 
peace negotiations or a ceasefire in this sense? Uh, sadly, not at all. And uh, mm -hmm. this is a, a great betrayal of the Irish tradition of neutrality, which the majority of people in this country uh, support. Um, I mean, rightly, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of the majority of people in Ireland, there is very strong condemnation of the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. We have sympathy with countries that are invaded by big powers. However, uh, equally, we do not, the people, the vast majority of people in this country do not trust NATO. They are very aware that the United States has also conducted equally brutal, unjustifiable and criminal uh, wars and invasions, most notably in Iraq in 2003, mm -hmm. uh, a war based on lies that claims, you know, maybe a million Iraqi lives that destabilized the entire region. People are aware mm -hmm. that the Western Bloc is supporting Israel in its brutal uh, persecution of the Palestinians. So what Irish people, I think, sympathize with is, is, is the op uh, oppressed and the exploited and the occupied of the world. And they believe that our neutral voice should be used to oppose warmongering and, and imperialism from wherever it comes and to argue for just and peaceful solutions, not military escalation to deal uh, with conflicts and, in and injustice in the world. Excellent. Now, uh, the arms industry, the military industrial complex, the big winners in war, uh, this section of the report, uh, Richard, highlights the arms deliveries to Ukraine, the replenishment of arms stocks and public money propping up the private arms industry. How do you read the increasing use of public funds to support the arms industry and has it become a positive contribution to what they term as the social sustainability, this kind of taxonomy as a nomenclature, as some might argue? Um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's absolutely no doubt that the arms industry uh, in, in Europe, in the United States, uh, and globally, anywhere in the world, uh, would not exist without the active support of states. Um, who prop that industry up, uh, and uh, I think that is a it is a, a essentially it is a theft of public resources to benefit uh, an industry that is about developing means to kill people rather than those resources, what well, public resources being used to invest in things like housing, like education, like health the things that actually make life better for ordinary people. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think it is, yeah, it is part of the sort of corporate takeover, the increasing corporate takeover of states uh, by, by these big industries who are driven purely by profit. Um, and in the case of the arms industry, who, who profit from death. Right. In mentioning the Imperial uh, Powers reports say that the UK is gifting Ukraine tanks equipped with depleted uranium rounds, sparking an international incident. This comes uh, 20 years after similar rounds were used in Iraq, causing lasting damage, including birth defects. Richard, uh, who actually defeated the US-led occupation in Iraq? Was it the resistance in the country? And what are the lessons learned today from this? Well, first of all, I, on the point about depleted uranium, and this is something I brought up in the Irish Parliament yesterday, sure. I really I really believe it is shocking uh, that we now have uh, the United Kingdom, other European states potentially delivering depleted uranium weapons uh, to uh, the Ukrainian forces for use in this conflict. When you consider... Uh, the extraordinary damage that those poisonous weapons did in Iraq in the war launched in 2003, uh, where, you know, it spread this toxic uh, poison, which led to increased uh, genetic abnormalities uh, in birth, uh, to increased levels of cancer. Uh, it, is, it is beyond shocking uh, that sure. these weapons... Uh, are being used and sold again. 
And uh, of course, it is interesting that although there's been, you know, many countries have called for a moratorium on these, including the elected parliament of the European Union have repeatedly caused, called for the uh, a precautionary moratorium on the use of deplete, depleted uranium uh, weapons, but this is being vetoed and systematically ignored by countries that produce these weapons. France, the U United Kingdom, obviously the United uh, States. Uh, so it is it is really immoral and shocking uh, that this is happening. Um, I, yeah, I'm Concer sorry. You're, concerning the you're lessons other... learned from the yes. uh, US-led occupation of Iraq and how it was driven out of the country. Oh, well, I think it was undoubtedly, it was the resistance of the Iraqi people. Um, uh, George Bush may have declared, I can't remember how long it was into that conflict, that their mission was accomplished. But of course, in reality, the Iraqi people continued to resist uh, and eventually uh, forced the withdrawal of uh, of the US invaders, just as the people of Vietnam, uh, at a terrible cost, had driven out the, the US invaders in, in Vietnam in, in the late 60s and early 70s. So it was the resistance of ordinary people who saw that invasion for what it was. It was an invasion for oil resources. It was an invasion that was justified on the basis of a, of a pack of lies about weapons of mass destruction. Um, so, uh, you know, there's an important lesson that these imperial powers may have tremendous weapons at their disposal, huge resources, but uh, people who are occupied will continue to resist just as the irish people resisted sure. british imperialism the vietnamese mm -hmm. the iraqis and indeed the palestinian people today right in talking about palestine today also 20 years uh, to the cold-blooded crushing to death by the israeli american-made bulldozer uh, of american peace activist racial Corey in rafah you have always been vocal and loud when it comes to the Palestinian cause, uh, Mr. Boyd Barrett, and the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people. Today, in face of this monstrous apartheid entity, how do you read what is going on in occupied Palestine while the world is turning a blind eye to the atrocities committed by the Israelis? Well, it is truly, truly shocking. Uh, and I mean, let's remember, this is a state, the Israeli state is a state that from its inception has been based on ethnic cleansing, on the theft of Palestinian land, on a racist apartheid system. But if it is possible for things to get worse, then they are getting uh, really uh, horrific at the moment uh, with the ascension of this very far right government, uh, the uh, the, the Israeli finance minister and the national security minister are, you know, really, they're fascists. I mean, there's no other way to describe these people. And when you hear them saying things like there's no such thing as the Palestinian people, uh, this is this is a code for really arguing for a genocidal war against the Palestinian people, uh, where they are now uh, completely blatantly and explicitly saying they are going to ignore international law, they're going to accelerate uh, legal settlements, we're having murderous attacks by the Israeli military uh, into Palestinian towns and cities. Uh, um, it, it's, it, it's horrendous. And what's most shocking of all, of course, is that the uh, Western powers who claim that they are concerned about illegal occupation, uh, illegal invasion, crimes against humanity, uh, war crimes in Ukraine, then say absolutely nothing about those same crimes being committed uh, by the Israelis against the Palestinians. There's right. no sanction for Israel, no, uh, no condemnation, quite the contrary. The United States, the Western powers, many of the European powers continue to actively support Israel, uh, to arm it, uh, to give it favored trade status, and it really exposes the extraordinary double standards and hypocrisy of the major Western powers. Of course, uh, Richard Boyd Barrett, Irish TD for People Before Profit Solidarity, talking to us from Dublin. Thank you very much, sir, for your insights. Pure pleasure to have you always, Richard. Thank you, Zainab.
Always welcome. ثمة العديد من الدروس والعبر قد يستقيها المرء من حرب أوكرانيا بحسب المتابعين لكن لعل أحد أهم الدروس في السياق في سياق هذا البحث هو أن العسكرة لا تأتي كلها وبناء سلام دائم هو من دون شك طريق طويل وشاق وحافل بالكثير من العقبات بيد أن أحد العوامل الحاسمة على طول هذه الرحلة هو اقتفاء الأمور التي لا تنتج وغير المثمرة وتغيير المسار قطعا العسكرة لا ولن تجعل المجتمع أكثر أمانا واليوم تستغل الحرب في أوكرانيا كستار دخاني لمزيد من العسكرة هذا خيار سياسي ستكون تبعاته مدمرة وقاتلة ومستدامة على السلام العالمي إلى متى يبقى أولئك القادة والمنتفعون في الغرب ممن يدعون أنهم دعاة سلام يتلطون وراء لوثة العسكرة والحروب العبثية بذريعة الدفاع عن حقوق الإنسان والديمقراطية من كل الميادين في مالة